Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Johnson. I'm the Curator of Performance and Moving Image at Dunlop Art Gallery and Regina Public Library Film Theatre. Um, I'm a first-generation settler of Danish descent, currently based in Oxkana Kasatake, also known as Pile of Bones, also known as Regina, located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional territories of the Nehewak, Soto, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis. On behalf of RPL Film Theatre, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion with Zora Zahir and filmmaker Nilufer Pereza about uh, her films Act of Dishonor and Audition. Both these films are available online and Act of Dishonor is courtesy of our partners at the National Film Board and you can find the links to the side in the comments section. Uh, following this discussion, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions and I encourage you to add these to the chat on the right hand side. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Nilufa Pereza is an Afghan Canadian director, author, actress, and journalist based in Toronto. She lived in Kabul, Afghanistan, and while it was occupied by Soviets, known for her feature film, Act of Dishonor, her family escaped to Pakistan and then immigrated to Moncton, New Brunswick, more than two decades ago. She studied journalism at Carleton University and a master's in anthropology, sociology, and religion at Concordia. Perizad tried to return to Afghanistan in 1996 while the country was under Taliban rule. The purpose of her trip was to find a lost childhood friend. She was not successful, but the, f the famous film Kandahar was made based on her journey. This film was presented at the Cannes Film Festival in 2001. She's also made many documentaries on Afghanistan since then. Zor Zahir is the co-host of Naveya Ashena, a Persian language show on CJTR Community Radio. Her education and experience are a mix of many things. She is a poet and a translator in her spare time. Last year, she was a manager at a children's magazine in Afghanistan. Finally, love of science makes up most of her time. Zor is a master of science in genetics and currently is a graduate student at the University of Regina. And I now invite Zora to open this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thomas. You, Thomas. Oh, hi, Nilofar. Hi, Zora. Thank you. Thank you for finding time. I know that it's a, like a very unprecedented time and like finding a little bit time to, to open a discussion with us. That, that's really like something that I think I have to appreciate it at the, at the beginning. Um, okay, so before we start talking about both of the one documentary and one of the movie that one of them we showed last week and one of the documentary we're showing this uh, this afternoon in the RPL and also this online version of it. Uh, I just want to say that the audition was a documentary, but what about the act of dishonor? Was it a kind of also documentary for you or like, you know, like the tent, the unit CR tent, the people, the scene, everything else? I mean, did you make up something or it was as it was shown in the movie? Well, look, I mean, for me personally, as a filmmaker, I'm always very interested or keen on the idea of pushing the boundaries uh, between documentary and feature or dramatic film. Because, you know, um, we often say that real life, um, you know, fact is uh, far more stranger than fiction. So when the, some of the most surreal scenes that you can see that becomes part of a film at a certain point um, those real surreal moments happen in real life and then we take that and sort of add use our imagination to reinforce or enhance certain messages onto it um, and i'm also very much interested in working with real life people part of it is that um, in afghanistan as much as there is a history of cinema but it wasn't a very um, widely, um, I guess, a spread kind of a part of art and culture, especially not in the countryside. You know, movie theaters were basically in, in Kabul and a few other major cities around the country, but uh, not accessible to majority of population would live and grow up in countryside. Um, 
but there is such a love of cinema in Afghanistan. There is such a love of, of that this form of art. And a lot of it obviously has to do to some extent with the presence of Bollywood next door in India because it has a big influence. Um, but there is a huge interest among the population um, of wanting to be part of this world, not only just watching the films, but also to be part of it. And so for me, um, trying in any of the work I have done, um, the films I have made, that instead of going and, and finding professional actors and actresses to hire or bring, which is great, I've kind of done a mix uh, of both. I'm also very keen in giving opportunity to people who would want to have a part in a film and if they can play themselves, for example, uh, in the act of dishonor, um, the uh, imam, the, the mullah that sort of is, um, you know, presented in the film, he actually is a real imam. He, you know, he was the imam of the local mosque. And um, I had a lovely story about him because the first time when I met with him, I said that I'd like you to be part of the film. And he assumed that what it meant is that he was going to be um, reciting a poem or something. So he'd actually written one, okay? Um, and, he, and, he had, and he had wanted to do this um, as an appreciation for mother, which is very important, obviously, in our culture. We know in a lot of, I mean, all cultures around the world, of course, the special place for mothers in our hearts and in our culture and our art. So, um, so he was prepared this poet to do it and when we said Where, when are you going to film it and I I wanted to dedicate this and I said to him no what I'm not going to be um, recording a, 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 a poet a poem that you would recite but I, I want you to be yourself and he said but in front of the camera I, I'm not I supposed to not be myself because I'm myself in everyday life <laughs> so and I said that's exactly what I want it was a very delicate conversation because I didn't want to show that I didn't appreciate his enthusiasm or his own interest in wanting to present what he thought would be appropriate to present, but um, also to get him to participate, just be himself. So it took a few kind of uh, conversations of, of that delicacy and tries, but he was a very open-hearted person. And eventually he said to me, so you want me to look like this, like in my own clothes, like you're not going to give me... I said, no, you're going to be in your own stuff. You're going to just talk to people as if you meet the family and, you know, they come to your mosque and there you're, you know, kind of offering your own um, sermon as you do. And uh, but that was very interesting because, you know, that's for me is that's the moment when obviously this person never thought of his own life and work as being valued in that sense. And the fact that someone like him had a chance and like him, a lot of other characters in Act of Dishonor are real life people, and um, and 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 so they are, you know, quite a, a bit of them are playing their own role, so to speak. Um, and that was something, uh, yeah. yeah, that was something new for them to just like be themselves, and then that that's that's totally what you wanted as someone who went to this village and says, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I think we can see know, him also yeah, are, here. I mean, in real life, people are, you know, and, and, and for me as well as a filmmaker, a, a good film, in my view, is not about the big drama. It's about those moments of reality that are becoming part of, I mean, they are part of our day life, and then you bring that out and share it with other people as part of a, a scene in a film. Totally. Um, I chose this uh, scene that you're talking, I mean, like you're seeing now, and I think for some of the posters, you chose this as the cover of the poster. And and I was just, I love this scene because it shows lots of things about the life of girls. Like they want to know about the whole world, like behind the walls. And then exactly what you said that, you know, that there was a small moments of, you know, your movie that just suddenly you're just like, oh my God, that that's, that's amazing. And I can just watch this scene again and again, and then it's not enough. And do you want to talk about this, this specific scene? Yeah, well, um, I mean, we also had the luxury because we were working on real location. So it wasn't a studio, it was a real place. Um, and uh, we could actually use that location and that um, house 
um, as a, a kind of a setup, which we had a lot access in terms of our camera position and places. It was almost kind of, we designed it to be like that. Um, and uh, the character of the film was confined to her home. Um, for me, it was important to not present her just as a kind of, a, you know, a, a, just a victim, helpless person, because I, I, I always, um, I guess, criticize and a lot maybe complain as well about how the Western media in general um, represents Afghan women as the, you know, kind of helpless creatures that they have no voice, they have nothing. So therefore, uh, it's constantly justified that the outside world will have to come and do something to help us, you know, to help Afghan women. So for me, this was a very important scene because it shows the uh, capacity and the in, in, uh, both in terms of the mind, but also in terms of that physical whether even if she's confined to a certain space, uh, she lives as a full human with that desire to want to know, and um, and and basically trying to explore something, and that's what eventually we move into the film. That from this wall. Um, eventually we we come to a point where she does push that wall out and she does get out of that that confined of world of, of her home um, and gets her into trouble but uh, but this, this particular scene also is about her curiosity it's about her desire to know um, and so in a way it is empowering uh, because she for me as an Afghan woman shows that despite all the limitations, she hasn't given up on things and she's not just helplessly sitting in a corner waiting for someone else to come and rescue her. Totally. I like that. And, and the fact that there was no subtitle when they were talking because their talk at that moment was really not important. It was just like she hearing something like here and there and, and yeah, so thank you for this. Um, let's talk about you. <laughs> That you, as someone who were left Afghanistan as a child, and then you didn't like experience lots of things that happened in Afghanistan, then you are here back in Afghanistan. Was there any something like something that you couldn't understand, you know, as as an Afghan who left Afghanistan as a very early age? Look, I mean, I, I believe that it's a, a, a very common experience in all the people who become refugees it is not particular to geography or to you know one community or the other or one nationality or the other um, the first generation of people who are forced to flee okay whether is it for economic reasons or is it for political reasons uh, in our case of course it was war but in the case of so many other people it, it's desperation for you know having to go abroad and try to find a better life and a better future and that's motivated by economy and desire to better education and better access uh, regardless of the reasons when you're forced to, to flee to leave your country aside from the trauma of going through that journey which is different for everybody because someone might have the access to get on a plane and go and someone may not and someone would walk across a train or someone takes a boat you know um but that generation, that first generation of being a refugee, you're in a limbo because you constantly think about what you left behind and everything becomes more exaggerated in some ways. So the taste of, I'm just going to refer to the specific scene that you've pulled this picture from. Um, for years and years, my father in Canada would always say, no, the fruit here has no taste. Okay. The fruit here, look, I just bought this peach for this much or this apple for this much. And no, nope, they don't taste the same. In Afghanistan, it used to be. But that is, I guess, a, a kind of a symptomatic of that desire of, of missing what you, what you have left behind and not being able to go back to that world. So in my case, I was fortunate enough um, and maybe I pushed myself to actually do it because nobody else from my own family member have gone back. But I wanted to go back to Afghanistan because when you go back to a country that you leave behind, it becomes a good reality test. And the test of reality, one, is that you do away with a lot of that sense of romanticism about the country. 
Um, not that there's anything wrong with it if, if that sustains you to get through a, and set up a new life, but nonetheless, it is important to have, especially in my case, because I'm a journalist and I wanted to be able to see things through a much more clearer light. And um, so returning back to Afghanistan was, was very helpful in that sense, to see that reality as the present of what it was happening as opposed to the reality that I saw when I left the country because no society is fixed everything constantly is changing and um and and sometimes we can freeze as an individual or a community with an image of that place or the taste of that fruit from that country in our minds where the country has moved on to be somewhere else so for me that was one um an incredible moment to be able to get back and the other thing it also does is it gives you the sense of appreciation about you have now. Because when you go back, there is, of course, the pain of discovering something that you left behind. And especially if the changes that are happened since are not for good, you know. So it's a painful trip. It was a painful trip uh, for me. And I've gone back, of course, I've, you know, cried so many times then. Um, and I've had the, you know, again, the privilege of being able to travel across Afghanistan as, you know, as an adult and as a journalist and as a Canadian or Afghan Canadian um, with access to, you know, the language of the, the local language and, and our languages and also, um the, the understanding of culture from inside, but coming from outside and having the protection of an outside passport. So it was, it is a very privileged position, but, but it, emotionally it was difficult at times to face that and recognize that the pain of departure and what you leave behind. And, um, and in this particular scene, what I wanted to get across was that idea that when you move away from a place, you know, some things change and some things don't change. And totally. human relation always is the one that will always remain despite whatever, um, I guess, torment one can go through uh, as a result of separation and departure. Oh, totally. I think that we mix everything with everything, like emotions and then all those memories with even like a simple cup of tea, you know. And then that cup of tea will never, ever be the same again just because of all those like moments that we experience on that moment. Um, I want to talk more about this scene, specifically that here you acting as Megan or Mushkan. And so are you talking about yourself in this like movie? Is it like the first place like you were supposed to play this role and then you suddenly also talk about yourself or no? It was how, how you ended up being as Mushkan here? Well, um, look, I, I wrote the script for the film based on my own research, you know, and travels in Afghanistan and, and experiences of actually working there with other film crews. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and part of this character, when I was writing it, I was basing a lot of it on my own experiences, because as an Afghan Canadian going back to the country, the complexities that you face in terms of aspects of your culture that you do not like because you look at it and you say why can't they just don't understand you know that there is this is an important factor for someone's life to be able to get out of the house and go and have you know access to things in life so um, and then you discover that, of course, aspects of your own culture has actually been tormented by so many years of war. And on top of it, of course, Afghanistan, let's not forget that you and I know this, um, that it is um, before the Soviet war um, started. It was um, a semi-feudal society with, you know, enough to survive, but not an incredible economic developments. And... Th that war really sort of changed the course of history in the country that instead of allowing any natural or, or uh, the kind of development that might have occurred as a result of being part of a global move, Afghanistan was derailed towards becoming a prior state and becoming a failed state. So we'd gone backwards, you know, and we used to say that in 2001 that we have gone backwards 30 years. And now you can imagine we've gone backwards 50 years, you know? And with the return of the Taliban, we actually gone back a century ago, you see? So because um, of that regression, sadly and unfortunately, 
um, no access to education, the effect of the war, the effect of the civil war. So each time I'd go back to Afghanistan, I had so many of my own battles to fight, you know, internally as an Afghan, but also with communities, uh, which I would want to be able to understand their point of view and respect it, but at the same time, not agreeing with that. Um, so I wrote this character in, 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 in part based on those experiences um, and that kind of a middle character, because for me, it wasn't just always aspects of my own culture or the people in Afghanistan, but also it's in relation to how the foreigners come to understand and see Afghanistan. And so this character particularly is between the two worlds where she is um, kind of belongs to both has appreciation for aspects of those cultures, but at the same time finds it very difficult that why is the Western world not capable of understanding the cultural nuances of a country that has gone through this trauma of war for all these years. And at the same time, she is somewhat trying to struggle to understand her own culture. So that's how I wrote the character. And um, and in a way, this character was also a link between the two worlds and the film, between the country and and the foreign team that goes to work there. So she she's kind of there that 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 link between the two worlds. And the idea is that her character should make it accessible for the two worlds to communicate with each other through this. Um, and I did cast it a, a, a another Afghan. Um, a girl, woman to go and play this role. And um, that was my hope that uh, I don't like to be in front of the camera. So I'm being trying to direct a film that was big enough of a, of a challenge in the circumstances of what I was doing and working with non-professional actors. And when you combine the two, and I might go back and comment on that separately, but um, so there was the challenges of doing this the way I wanted to make the film and the story itself and everything. And on top of it, it's not, it wasn't something I wanted to throw myself in front of the camera, but unfortunately the character who was not a professional actress, but someone that I'd casted and had a great potential, uh, it didn't come true, it fell true. Um, so as a last minute um, situation to make the film and don't have you know further delays to find another person, um, um, I sort of said, okay, well, I'll, you know, I was asked by, by my producer, would I consider? And I said, Dora, let me do tests because I'm not sure if I can be, you know, in front of the camera and pull this off. Um, but anyway, so I, I sort of throw myself and um, in, because I didn't really, it was written by myself and it was in part based on my own character. I didn't have to memorize lines, you know, it was kind of a, not a difficult thing to do in that sense of the actual role of it, but just, that split head between wanting to be in front of the camera and behind it was not necessarily the, um, you know, something ideal that I would like to do. Yeah. But you are an actress, like you play lots of other movies. Um, well, I, I'm not professional, you know, I mean, I've played, I've played myself, oh. I guess that's maybe, <laughs> you know, that's how I see it because to be yourself and to play yourself is, for me, that's part of real life. But I'm not professional actress in a sense that I've not gone to an acting class. I, you know, like the actual uh, tricks of acting and and uh, that developing that talent as a talent. I've never really worked on it. You know. Oh, I think you. I think you're being humble. It was. It was awesome. I mean, like if you never ever say that Mojgan supposed to be someone else and it's not not you, but. I think no one could have even believed that because as you said you were playing yourself and that was that was just enough for believing the character oh, thank you um i have another question but suddenly i remember like one thing about the director of the movie for example i forgot his name in this movie for example he's a director and he's not only ignoring the whole culture of these people, also ignoring the like Mojgan, who is from this country, and supposedly he probably she knows better than him. But I mean, how what what was the character of him was showing? Was it like representing the lack of knowledge of like Western people when they come into Afghanistan and they try even not to understand the culture? Well, look, I mean, um, I don't mean to be sort of creating, you know, just sort of, or I guess. Um, 
uh, using the stereotypes as a way to justify, um, you know, um, this particular, I guess, character in my film. But I, for me, that character, the the, the character of a director, um, who is quite sincere. I wanted to again not make him into a cardboard cut a person that he is sincere that he's interested that he has ambition and his idea is that his and this is true of all filmmakers and directors and people when you're driven you know like you have to sort of decide what what is that ambition and you have it and what's the goal so the goal for a person who wants to go and execute a project okay so let's assume it's not even a film let's assume it's a new story let's assume it's a photography let's assume it's maybe building you know a, a little dam or you know whatever it may be if that goal is there then you you go with that goal but along with that a lot of the information that has come into the mindset has come in from perceptions of a place as opposed to the real experiences of it and what I was trying to do with this character was somehow to criticize the system okay mm -hmm. because not only in Afghanistan but I can promise you because I also lived in Lebanon and I've spent a fair amount of time in various parts of the Middle East, um, traveling to, you know, from Egypt to Turkey to Syria, quite a lot in Syria recent years as well. And the typical situation is that you have either a film crew or a camera crew, a TV crew, they have a week maximum. And you don't even account for the fatigue of travel and exhaustion and you know, and the time adjustment. So the expectation because of the fast pacing uh, lifestyle we have in the West and because of the insurance and security costs and, every, and, you know, cost of living and the salaries and everything, like we face that ourselves with the film, with our foreign crew, that every week accounts for another, you know, lump sum of money that you have to pay to someone, which is, you know, either cost of living, cost of labor, whatever it is. So they have a limited time. And you arrive in a place utterly unknown to you. You might have read a bit about it. And then there is no time to really dig into the local culture. So if the opportunity is represented, some people may benefit from it a little bit. And some people don't even think about it. Like the director in my film, for instance, you know, he was kind of like, okay, I'm here to make a film. And that's what it is. I'm not here to do anything else on the side. That's not my job. I'm not a humanitarian. I'm not an NGO. I'm not, you know what I mean? So because of that, you have this conflict with the director and the local, the, the woman who's come with him to help him. Because until the moment they are in Afghanistan, he sees her like another Westerner. Okay. Just exactly like him on a mission to go and execute something on a schedule, okay? And whether that particular very narrow purpose, because otherwise you will not get it done, and then we're going to turn around and go back and carry on with our lives and finish our project, because that's what it is. And, you know, especially when it comes to projects and film and stuff, funding is so complicated that, you know, you're kind of, you can't afford to fail. So there is a, a sense of sympathy for him as well in my in my part of this character that he's he just doesn't want to fail. So therefore you he, he he treats her as another one like himself and but when she is in the country she begins to see things because of her own background differently and then the conflict between the two of them begins where She's trying to insist that he must try to understand the culture. And for him as a Westerner, it's very difficult. And it's not only in relation to filmmaking or the media. I've found myself quite a lot of times in various flights going to Kabul. And I'd be sitting next to someone who's coming from abroad. And that person would talk to me about how he, he, he doesn't understand why men do this or why women do that. This kind of a blanket generalization based on whatever footage or information that's been out there. And I'd be trying to explain and trying to sort of say, well, but you've got to have an open mind. But it's very difficult to get that across. Some people exceptionally are good at, at 
as their own perception and opening up to actually respect the differences. They don't have to agree with it, but at least have an understanding of it. Some people do not have that capacity or just not want to be bothered about it. Um, and, you know, and so because it's just um, a, a different kind of a groups of people from outside with, with where they come from and what's the knowledge of that country, you run into the risk of finding out that the same image of what I was saying earlier about an Afghan woman being helpless gets perpetuated, you know? It just kind of goes in circles because you're fitted into a certain kind of a cut, uh, size that you fit in there you're either this or you're either that and the gray the things that are in between and they are the complexities are easily forgotten or ignored so that's why i think the, the relationship of the director and and uh megan or michigan was important to me to capture or try to capture some aspects of that awesome thank you and I totally understand. I mean, when it comes to the culture and then like sometimes you have to step up as like Mojgan stepped up for that girl. And then, for example, if, it, it's, if it's about education or something, you cannot say that it's the culture of that. But if it's about the beautiful culture of someone wants to do this and then wiping out that culture is exactly like wiping out the whole nation's like idea and memory and yeah i i think that was just shown perfectly in this in this movie mm. okay so uh i think i will end up the question about this movie with this that so you went to this for example small village they will never know like what is cinema what is like you know movie what is films and all and so it's exactly what happened with me in 2004 when I went back to my father's village and they didn't have any electricity. They didn't know, you know, the, the outside world, like at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. when there was no light, so the life is done and then you just sleep and then again in the morning, four o'clock, you start, you're working on your farms and all. But 20 years later, like, like every single house in that village have electricity, fridge, like they have TVs, laptops, smartphones and all. I'm, I'm wondering if, ever you think about to making a sequel of this movie bring back and then everyone knows about all these technologies and all have you ever thought of that i actually hadn't thought about it look i i you know you make one film on the basis of something and then i you know you go off and do other things so um i i you know i would have loved to have gone back and do more projects but as it is unfortunately at the current circumstances the way i work is i like to go in a real place and with real people um that is very difficult at the moment given the situation in the country with the taliban and uh, um you know but i think one of the things that has happened which is very important is that since let's assume my experience of going back in 2002 in afghanistan after 13 years um, since I left the country when I was 16. Um, the country was in shambles. You know, refugees were just returning from Iran and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And um, other Afghans like myself were coming back from various parts of, you know, foreign countries abroad in the West and Australia and others. Um, and in the last 20 years, each time I went back, and I remember... Um, my parents were watching um, Afghan TV in Canada. It was a good form of entertainment, kept them in contact with news and information. And my mother, each time I went to, to, to visit my parents, um, my mom used to say to me, oh, you must come and watch this program. It's on Afghan TV and it's, you know, Afghan star or it's this or that. And I used to say, oh, mom, but I go to the country all the time, you know, like, so it's okay. And and I was in Kabul and I um, sort of uh, I asked my mother about something that I, I was in Kabul and I hadn't actually told them that I was in Kabul um, because I didn't want to get them very worried. So I often just, you know, kind of went away and um, and and my mother said, oh, um, the yeah, tonight we're going to watch the final episode or final sequence of this Afghan star program, which is on Afghan TV. And I said, oh, that's great idea. That's fantastic. And then I put the phone down and I asked a colleague that was there with me. And I said, what is this? And he said, oh, it's the, have you been to it? And I said, no, would you like to go? I said, yeah, I'd love to go and see it. So I went into the studio. 
they are filming with eight cameras, okay? Absolutely impressive setting. And all in the front rows were all young Afghan women. And I was just amazed at the amount of interest and the degree of the talent that was there. And I sort of sat in the background. I said, I remember telling my friend, I can't be sitting in the front in case my mom's watching. <laughs> so I don't want to, you know, shock her. I have to be somewhere in a way far away so I'm not on camera. And I went to the very quiet background corner. And the whole time I was just watching, I was amazed at what has actually could possibly happen to this country. And, and that's exactly what you're saying. So that would be the sequel of my film because this is exactly what has happened. That with a bit of an opportunity, a little bit of a chance for development, the Afghans would take advantage of the smallest possible thing and turn it into everything they could have. So that was quite... And, and of course, when I came back to Canada, I said to my mother, Oh, I, I, it was fantastic program, wasn't it? And she said, yes. And I said, I was there. <laughs> so, you know, kind of, they weren't surprised because they knew I always moved, um, you know, like kind of, I went to a lot of dangerous places and, uh, you know, kind of been lucky to get away from a lot of the, the <laughs> kind of circumstances. Um, my dad never said anything. My mom would always be worried for me. So, but anyway, that was kind of, for me, that's just a small, tiny bit of, that Afghanistan, like the village of that the one that you're talking about, that for the last years there's been so much that the Afghans have managed to do, you know, that they've transformed their country, they've transformed their lives, their small worlds, and every household would have a TV. If they couldn't afford it, the, the neighborhoods would have shared cables so that they can all get to watch the programs in a shared way because maybe it was too expensive for one home you know, to be able to afford to have it. So, and that's the sadness of all of that is it's all been just thrown away like that, you know? Yeah, I remember. So in that village, you, you as a woman, you cannot walk on the main street. So there's lots of small alleys that you have to find your way through there, even if there is like a shorter way on the, on the main street. And then I didn't know about that. So mm -hmm. I was just used to take this main street back and forth and all. And then they come to my father and says, your daughter cannot walk on oh, the main cute. street. <laughs> and I was like, why? And so my father says that it's the main street, she can walk. So I start to do that. So what it took a very long time that is gradually women start to walk on the main street and it was a huge thing because next time when I saw that I was like yes like now we can walk on the main street and I don't know for me it was just something that suddenly gradual not suddenly but gradually a village just mm -hmm. transformed mm -hmm. um speaking of the opportunity so when uh, let's talk about the audition <laughs> This one, this scene was actually one of those opportunities that shows us the beauty of like the different cultures that they want to show their culture to Afghanistan, to like these people. And like, you know, tell us more about this scene. It's the well, Korean uh, yeah, dance. Yes. No, what happened is, uh, look, I, because I was doing the research for Act of Dishonor, and as part of that research, I was traveling across the country in Afghanistan. I was talking to people. And uh, Bamyan happens to be one of my favorite, you know, cities, obviously. Um, we made a film, uh, The Giant Buddha, which is another documentary about the destruction of the, uh, the monumental Buddha statues, which is, you know, a, a, it was a tragedy for the world because it was a world heritage site and the Taliban, in, uh, unfortunately, in their first round of destructive uh, behavior, they um, use explosives to destroy those two uh, monumental statues. So um, I was quite impressed with um, what I saw in Bamiyan, and I said, oh, I'll go and do further research because I will be writing this film. And um, I was there, and the university students invited me to go in the university. They're all men. All, um, and they. I was quite intrigued because for my film, I, as part of my research, I wanted to understand the mindset of an Afghan man who grows up in a, in a kind of, a, um, I guess, remote areas in the countryside. 
um, with limited access to information or knowledge, or even if there is some information, there is always also that patriarchal setup, you know, that, that belief system that you're superior as a man. And but I don't want it to judge it. I wanted to understand it. So I went to Bamiyan, and when we were there, um, I saw this incredible scene where a, a group of Korean missionaries had come to Bamiyan, and they were performing this beautiful dance and their own music in front of the destroyed the statues of the Buddha. Um, and then they were also trying to. Um, they were. Uh, uh, spending time with the local, especially local children and women, and uh, they have set up a little makeup, uh, you know, sort of area. They have set up a little sort of a clinic, um, and the locals were very curious. They were mixing with them, and and for me it was interesting because I kind of you see that that stark um, backdrop of that sand and and bleached landscape, and then you have this vibrant color of another culture. And the two are in such harmony with each other, despite their contrast. But that also was a sign of the openness of Afghanistan. You know, we have a very bad reputation, unfortunately, in the West and the outside as very close minded people. You know, they, they always refer to Afghans as, oh, the ones they don't want to change, the ones that they have this very, you know, um, culture of uh, tribal culture. OK, so. But for me, this scene in itself and that moment, the fact that there are Buddhist, st Buddhist statues, Bamiyan used to be one of the most important Buddhist, you know, sort of, uh, um, of, of sanctuaries. And there was a, a, a Buddhist cemetery, in fact, in Bamiyan, um, which is, um, um, it's a kind of an, an, an enclave and it's inside a, a cave and, and, and deep down inside it. Um, so that shows that Afghans throughout the history have been very open-minded and it's a culture that embraces other cultures. The fact that we have a faction of a group of a very right-wing religious militia who, in my view, are not necessarily informed by religion, but by a very restrict interpretation and a and a kind of a not only extreme interpretation, but also a very violent interpretation based on their own, not based on knowledge or history or anything else. Just because the Taliban have come to destroy everything that's in Afghanistan and Afghan history and Afghan culture, they are perceived as representative of Afghans. And so for me, this scene was very important because it becomes in present day an acknowledgement of that rich history of openness and the amalgamation of cultures that has happened throughout the history in, in, in what is Afghanistan now. Totally. I mean, yeah, I mean, like it was beautiful. Like, and I remember like every, when I was like, I was in Afghanistan for six years, 2004 to 2010, 11. And I could see that lots of people come, foreigners, you know, we didn't have cinema in Herat. So we had a cinema, but it transformed to uh, a mosque. But Mm, we didn't have a cinema but still we have like a small like places that we could just have a projector and then showing the different movies and different theaters and we were part of a theater there and I, I could see that we want to to find the best of everywhere like and to know what what can we learn from others and that is totally like shown in this scene I mean I love it <laughs> thank you um about the audition, something that I think it was very, very prominent was like the men was like so enthusiastic and passionate to be in front of the camera and then talk about it. And then when you were talking with them, they were like some like best students of the world that listening to their teachers and they just want to be the best student of your class to maybe, maybe be on your movie. And then here we have women. With, for example, her with all this talent, when she started to cry, I, I started to cry as well because it was so real. It just showed all the pain. And at the mm. same time, the, I mean, she's a talent person. So tell us about men, women, her specifically, and what happened? Do you know where is she or whatever? 
Well, look, I mean, as you say, um, uh, Afghan men were very, very enthusiastic about being given a chance and a role. And it was also interesting to see beyond that, you know, enthusiasm, what had informed it and their idea of why they wanted to be in a film, you know, and what did they like to achieve and how that knowledge had come from, whether was it an experience of growing up in a, as a refugee in Iran or was it an experience of growing up as a refugee in Pakistan or being, um, you know, exposed to Indian films or reenacting for someone comedy was the most important for someone else was you know a love song was more was an idea of an acting so that kind of a diversity of an opinion even among men was very interesting for me because we often again um kind of victimized the, the afghan man too we we kind of put them in into a little corner as this kind of very harsh character very violent very you know um in a way, yes, they're part of a patriarchal system, but they're also victim of that system, you know, because for them to have been burdened with the question of honor and preservation of that, that honor, and it will take generations for people to break away from those yokes. So in a way, with a great sense of sympathy, I also wanted to understand the mentality and mindset of Afghan men in relation to question of women and question of cinema and question of images. And at the same time, I was also very interested to see what was women's reaction. While men were often enthusiastic and always had no question about wanting to be up front, going as far as even ridiculing themselves to, to act a scene that they thought they were doing the best presentation of. Where when it came to question of women, there was fear, there was reluctance and hesitation. Even when there was someone like um, this lovely girl who was so talented and she was just trying to reenact the scene that she comes home from school and she just tells her mother she had a hard day. And she just starts crying and then she starts crying for real. Um, and so for me, but I also discovered there were other women. Uh, there was another young woman in, in the film as well who actually kind of is a drama for me and, uh, and acts the, the role of a wife in a relationship based on her understanding of what a wife would be like while she's still so young yourself you know um and uh but 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 she says oh i, I said what do you like about being in a film and she says oh i like the fame and the money i said is it the money or is it fame and she goes oh the fame you know and so you can see that of course in a lot of women that desire as well to be seen the desire as well to be out there and be recognized is an end it's there but it's because of the layers of cultural you know complexity and 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 centuries of patriarchal oppression that they try to conceal that so they hide away behind things then when i push that a little bit further they all kind of laugh you know and then there was okay for them to be in front of the camera providing if their man folks won't see it or what do i do with this film they don't want their neighbors to see it in case they're being judged so that immediately shows you that society the way it has been formed and the way it's been kind of going around century after century of, of this kind of expectation of women um but that again for me was very much uh, a revelation about you know the the kind of uh um relationship of man and woman image and the picture um but but again the the interesting thing since i uh, made um audition uh which was in 2009 since then there is you know in the early days i will refer back to let's say to afghan star or the tv programs or even music and afghan women you would have only one or two people would come forward. But by the time the Taliban arrived in Kabul, majority of, I mean, look at the Afghan, you know, orchestra, all women orchestra. Then you, by that, like add another 11 years to 2009. And in the last 11 years, because that's the generation that were teenagers at the time. And by 2021, they are young adults they all have found places in art and music and cinema, the TV dramas. So clearly, 
that hesitation that existed in women, even in those remote areas of the country, were very gradually being changed and, and, and something better and more positive was, was coming out to take its place. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, like, even like in the village, you know, the people understand the value of all these things. Even they didn't like be sh shame if they're, they are in the TV or like, you know, I took a picture of my aunt and to, to show like, it was like a, uh, a magazine. And then I asked her for her photo. And then there's like a huge photo of her in front of this magazine. And then she said that just don't bring it to the village. And I was like, yeah. don't worry about it. Yeah. But I love it. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about this scene. I don't know if it's hard or not, but did you scared when this conversation were just like going on, not only for your life, but in overall, when this, you know, very funny man talking about like beheading her sister if she's become like in front of the camera or like that people were seeing him and is it like the act of dishonor just born like from this scene or no yes look i mean the part as well as i said is for me the importance uh, i i believe in responsible cinema and i believe in the cinema that actually you know um can break through some aspects of whether it's art culture language anything and open up possibilities for debate and discussions okay and so as part of that research i wanted exactly as i said to find out sort of the, the mindset behind the relationship to picture and images and the relation of men and women so um in that university setting i have had a lot of guys who were including this lovely you know young man wanted to be on camera himself he had no problem with it and he in fact was very enthusiastic about it and when I said what about your sister and he said no but what are you talking about my sister will not go in front of camera why because she's my sister yeah, but she's not your possession no but he she's not and I said so why and what would happen if she did let's assume I just went to her and she said yes she went in front of the camera and then he said oh well in that case if it he, it was very interesting he, the nuances that he said the first time if it happened and if it was a mistake and she apologized you she'll be forgiven but if it happened again and again there is no choice for him except to you know be hit her and it was a it wasn't shocking in a sense. It, it, it was alarming um, mm -hmm. to hear someone in that context so openly and with such ease talk about that degree of violence. Mm -hmm. But when you put it in the context of the country where one of his actually um, um, fellow students said to me, we grew up in the war. We are product of war. So violence is part of our everyday breeding and existing uh, and existence so therefore when you look at the larger context you begin to understand that the use of the word of beheading is part of everyday vocabulary and almost unknowingly or unconsciously you know so but then he i had a big discussion and then he turned to me and he said well would you tell me what's the purpose of your trip here and for me, that was a very important moment, personally, because I felt, despite the fact that here is a young Afghan man who finds it difficult to accept her sister going to be in front of a camera or be in public, but his curiosity about wanting to know I as an Afghan woman, and he did it with such great respect as well. Yeah. So the whole time, there was enormous amount of respect for me. And I began to feel that that was a very, very interesting situation because if they see more of Afghan women like me, okay, if they're more exposed where they can have a serious discussion, okay, where they can be engaged and be challenged, okay, and in a very civilized setup and take them seriously, listen to them, but also allow them to listen to you, as a result of that exchange, maybe a tiny seed is planted in his mind to think that, well, if she is an Afghan woman and if she is doing this and it clearly there was nothing wrong in that discussion that we are having and I'm sitting literally next to him in that, you know, um, student hostel room, 
with all other boys circling around us and listening to every word of what I was saying very carefully. I thought there may be that little seed and he would begin to say, well, hold on a second. Am I, am I thinking correctly? Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that we can change the world, but I believe that with every single step, with every single word, if one has the right intention and if one puts the right uh, energy and time into it, you know, it could possibly make a difference. And um, so in, in a sense, more than being frightening to me, it was more an invitation to understand and, and, and also to search for these little moments where you can plant that little seed. And, and you're correct, because that became the idea of act of dishonor, because that's as far as someone can go with severity of, of, of a thought. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there is also grace and there is also forgiveness and there is also human curiosity. Totally. And oh, I can talk to you like for hours and hours and it's just so joyful. But um, I'm going to just finish this conversation with this beautiful picture of women that with all those fears, with all those knowing, still they are here in front of the camera smiling. And then that's the beautiful picture. If if you want to add some some words about this picture specifically, that would be awesome. Well, look, I mean, this family, I put it in context. They live in that cave inside there, okay? So that's their home. It's just one small room, completely not in the shape of something you would call a house, but it's a cave. It's quite actually lovely in in some ways. There is no heating. There is no, you know, like they just kind of burn a bit of wood in there to keep it warm. Uh, Amyan gets very cold in the winter months. Um, But... uh, that whole family, that the you know the grand, uh, the mother-in-law, and then the two um, girls, they're actually married to the sons and their their children, and the um, little girl that she's holding while standing there, the woman was standing in front in the fore, foreground. Her name is Momina, and um, I went in and they actually talked to me quite a bit, and the moment I brought my camera, they all cut their faces. At first, and we engaged in discussions and why and how. And eventually, what I discovered is that they have never been photographed before. Oh. So I asked them, is it okay if I take a picture? And they didn't, I mean, they, they kind of wondered what it was. So I took a picture and I showed them their pictures and they were so excited about that. Um, and it's not to say that the Afghan, uh, you know, Afghans are so backward or whatever, but it means that there's such a lack of development. You know, when I was traveling to Bamiyan, we used to take nine hours to go from Kabul to Bamiyan um, because there was no road to the, to the place. Um, in the last few years, thankfully, there was a highway built, you know, and sort of four European countries contributed towards that. But before that was built, you know, you, you traveled only at 30 kilometers per hour because of the train. Um, you couldn't drive any faster. It was all dirt track or just in the corners, like on the, the car would be on kind of a loop sided because you would be driving along a hill top or a mountain range. Um, so imagine with the lack of development, with the lack of access, with the, you know, um, no surprise that someone would have not ever had their picture taken because there was no ID cards involved. There was no registration involved. There was no, you know, so, but a lot of that has changed since too, because Bamiyan started to really develop quite fast. You know, when I went there first time, there was no electricity whatsoever, like you say about your own village in Herat. Um, but then they brought the electricity. They, they were the ones where we started talking about building a cultural center in Bamiyan, and they were very open to that. Mm-hmm. Um, their university was was opened one of the times when I was visiting there, and majority of the people attending were women as well. So you can see that in a very short space of time, so much changed. But in this particular photo, it, it is, it's the three generations of women that are part of that lifestyle, and none of them had been photographed before. Oh, totally. Thank you. And uh, I'm wondering if there's any question from our audience. I I don't see any. Um, 
So if there is no question for the last thing that I will ask a question that what is your advice like in maybe one or two sentences for Canadian that wants to know about different culture? Well, look, I mean, the good thing about Canada, thankfully, is we because we are a country of refugees. Everybody's come from somewhere. And um, and more importantly, where we also have come from to live and to enjoy living in this beautiful land also is the land of ancient, you know, um, native dwellers that have been there and their way of life and their method um, of, of living and surviving um, in, in, in a place like Canada, which, you know, um, has not been so easy as a country to, to be able to survive in it at times when there had been not as much the degree of development as we are being fortunate to have now. Like I often think about Canada and I always think to myself, well, go back in your mind. And if I want to complain about cold, I should remember how would it feel like 200 years ago where there wouldn't be no central heating, you know, and very basics. And there are, you know, plenty of thankfully good books written and, and stories. Uh, I, I guess Canadians as well are very good at storytelling um, that um, captures aspects of that, that life. So because of that, I think there is a lot of interest in wanting to understand cultures. And it, it's not as difficult to, because if you come from somewhere and you already have an accent and you already have a history of your own parents or grandparents or great grandparents who had migrated, there is that it breaks a lot of barriers. Um, so I and again, I will never say to myself that I'd be in a position to advise on anything. But what, if anything, I would say as a as sharing from my experiences would be, is that always be prepared to ask questions, and give people the benefit of the doubt, and reserve judgment, because that's often if we start with judging then we take those stereotypes and it feeds into our conclusions and that could be wrong. So for me, it's always important that we must ask questions first. We must allow to ourselves and, and challenge ourselves to try to listen. It's like if I saw someone coming from Somalia, I don't want to judge them and say their country is famous for, you know, female mutilation. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't judge them and say this is a country of pirates. I would like to say, well, hold on a second. This is a country with a history. This is a country with a history of violence and war because of all the um, unfortunate circumstances of what they have suffered from. So I like to know what that individual that has come from that country, what's their particular experience, what are their own understanding of their culture, and how would they wish to be seen as human beings and acknowledged? And in response to that, I'd expect the same from that person in relation to me and my country. Thank you so much. And as Janet says, that does, it was very informative. And thank you so much. Thank you, Janet, to join us and lots of other people that they came to this discussion. And I mean, thank you again, Nilufar and RPL to, for, this, for this opportunity. No, no, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank, thank you to you Thomas and as well and the light to see another African woman uh, opening up these discussions and inviting everyone for these cultural exchanges. And your own stories are as valuable in your observation. So I I feel privileged that I've been able to have this exchange with you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. And yeah, I wish the conversation could continue longer and I think it will. Um, and if we are able to do that online, uh, we'll definitely let you know. But also just to remind everyone in Regina that uh, audition will be in the film theater tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, and that you can still watch it online along with Act of Dishonor uh, through the links uh, that are in the, included in the chat. But thanks you so much, uh, Nilufer and Zora and everyone who watched here. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.